Well, hello and welcome to our recorded meeting for Sunday the 23rd of August. Uh, our brother Roger will be bringing the message, the Word of God, later, so I'm opening the meeting now. I'm basing the prayer uh, and matters for praise that I'm going to bring to the Lord now mainly on the prayer letter, if not exclusively on the prayer letter that I hope most of you, all of you, get and certainly can get online or in a paper format. You can do that by just simply uh, going to the website or something and finding out. You will gladly let you have that if you don't already. So let's pray together. We're grateful, our God, for all your goodness and kindness. You love us. You know each one of us individually. You're you have a plan. We want to hear from you, fit in with it. We want to glorify you, be helped ourselves to be able to help others, to make progress in the faith if we love you already, and to be open to truth, to be taught something from you if we're looking for truth and are not sure about the faith in Christ. Yet we just pray for your grace, whatever our need, as we listen now and look we pray that you would meet kindly with us bless your people up and down the land lord we are deeply troubled land so many divisions we pray that there may come a new sense of peace and unity in yourself there's nowhere else pray that the gospel would be heard and received in many places pray for our sister dawn thank you for the improvement in these uh, relief from these migraines. Could grant that that would continue in your love and mercy. We thank you, Lord, for Bemiger's knee and its improvement after this operation. Continue to cause him to be healed, give him guidance in regard to this year and, and what to do about university and so on. Uh, and pray, Lord, for your rich, powerful blessing for him. We pray for Margie. We thank you that she's due out today, Saturday, uh, as I pray from the hospital. Pray that you would heal her, just guide and help. All who are finding the way difficult with regard to the burden of years, pray for Ray and Joyce again. We pray for Mrs. Smith. Lord, there's so many on our minds. Bring your people to you. We pray for David Collier, and Mary and the family, those of them who need you for salvation. Thank you for those who love you. But thank you for this healing for David, really. And pray that he may, and Mary, find your salvation. Pray for Elizabeth, my daughter. She's particularly asked for confidence in your word. It is absolutely your word. Pray that the truth of that may direct and guide her and all of us. Uh, and that she may have boldness and wisdom in her witness to you, as you're found in the Bible and what you've done for her. Pray for these friends of Emmanuel too, who have both lost parents. Pray for comfort, life from yourself, and that you'd keep them from error, uh, guide them to yourself, and make Emmanuel your witness to them. Meet us in this meeting. Bless our brother Roger. Pray that your word may come to our hearts. Bless every part, everyone who takes any part in this meeting. We look to you for help and thank you in the name of our Lord Jesus. Amen. Amen. How great the chasm that lay between us How high the mountain I could not climb In desperation I turned to heaven And spoke your name into the darkness, your loving kindness, tore through the shadows of my soul. The work is finished, the end is written, Jesus Christ, my living. 
Welcome to today's children's spot. I'm going to start off with a quiz. On the next slides, I have pictures of three famous people, and I'm going to give you three facts or clues about each one. What I would like you to do is see if you can guess who the famous person is. Ready? Who am I? I live in a big house in London. I have two birthdays. My face is on a stamp. Who am I? That's right, it's Queen Elizabeth II. Next person, who am I? My favorite subject at school is science. I help to fight crime. I was bitten by a radioactive spider. Who am I? That's right, it's Spider-Man. 
final person. Who am I? I went to the same school as David Beckham. I have won back-to-back -back Premier League Player of the Month awards. I play for Tottenham Hotspur. Who am I? That's right, it's Harry Kane. Hopefully you were able to guess at least some of those famous people. Now, I'd like to tell you a story from the Bible when Jesus asked his disciples a very similar question. It's found in Matthew chapter 16, verses 13 to 20. One day, Jesus asked his disciples this question. Who do people say I am? The disciples thought about all the things they had heard the crowd say about Jesus, and they said, Some say John the Baptist. Others say Elijah or Jeremiah or one of the other prophets. Then Jesus asked them, who do you say I am? The disciples thought about all they had heard Jesus say and all of the things they had seen Jesus do. They could have said, you're a carpenter or you're a teacher or a leader. They could have said, you're a miracle worker or a prophet or even just, you're a good man. You can probably think of some more suggestions of your own. But they didn't say that. Peter, one of Jesus' disciples, answered Jesus and said, you are the Messiah, the son of the living God. This wasn't something Peter could have figured out on his own. This was something that God had revealed to him. Now, all those things we said about Jesus are true. Jesus really was a carpenter and a teacher and a leader and a miracle worker, a prophet and a good man. But Jesus is also much more than that. He is the son of God and God's promised saviour and king, the Messiah. Sometimes we can make Jesus seem like less than he is. Sometimes we do it deliberately and sometimes just through our own carelessness. But it is very important. It is very important to remember that Jesus is the Messiah, God's promised saviour and king. That he is the son of God. It is this truth about Jesus that God is building his church on. And it is this truth that we can build our lives on. That Jesus is our saviour and king and the son of God. Finally, if Jesus asked you this same question, who do you say I am? How would you answer? Thank you for listening. Praise the Lord. My name is Vincent Salesman and I'm a member of the Lincoln Road Chapel. There are two things I would like to give thanks to the Lord for today. Firstly, I would like to thank the Lord for guiding and protecting me and my family during this lockdown. The earlier part of this year was very testing for us. My father passed away in March and the planning of his funeral was very difficult. He lives in Birmingham and we live in London. Travelling during this time was proving very difficult. We were not able to communicate with anyone face to face 
and all our communication during the planning of the funeral was by telephone or email. We were thinking of a church blessing for him, but this was not possible. We start to think about how can we get a church blessing for him. We did not know the pastor for the area that he lives and we could not visit his local church in Birmingham. We started to pray about it and a week later his neighbor provided us with contact details of the local pastor. We got in touch and she stated that she would be able to do a mini service in the cemetery. Service which was consisted of Bible reading, two hymns and a short tribute. This was something that we were looking for. The funeral was able to go ahead with the kind of blessing we were looking for, bear in mind the time that we were in. God did answer our prayer and allow my father a blessing on his final journey. He led us to the local pastor who was able to do this mini service in the cemetery and she promised a memorial service in her church when it is convenient to do so. The Lord is good. The second thing that I would like to thank the Lord for is the last 40 years that me and Movita spent together. On this day 40 years ago we were married. I think doing this testament was the work of the Lord. When pastor asked me to do this testimony on the 23rd, I think it is the Lord that inspired him to do so. This was not something that we discuss or arrange. It just happened. It's a reminder from the Lord that we should give thanks for all these years together. The years has been good with challenging times, but without his blessing, the road would have been more difficult. I would like to thank the Lord for keeping us together and keeping us alive for all these years. I would like to thank the Lord for all our three wonderful children and two granddaughters who had given us a lot of pleasure over the years. I would like to read to you Psalms 18 verse 6. In my distress I call upon the Lord and cried unto my God. He heard my voice out of his temple and my cry came before him even in his ears. Thank you for listening.
verse reading today is taken from Hebrews chapter 11, verses 1 to 3. That's Hebrews chapter 11, verses 1 to 3. Now, faith is being sure of what we do hope for, and certain of what we do not see. This is what the ancients were commended for. By faith, we understand that the universe was formed at God's command, so that what is seen was not made out of what was visible. And the next reading is from Hebrews chapter 11, verse 30, until chapter 12, verse 2. That's Hebrews chapter 11, verse 30, until chapter 12, verse 2. By faith, the walls of Jericho fell, after the people had marched around them for seven days. By faith, the prostitute Rahab, because she welcomed the spies, was not killed with those who were disobedient. And what more shall I say? I do not have time to tell about Gideon, Barak, Samson, Jephthah, David, Samuel and the prophets, who through faith conquered kingdoms, administered justice and gained what was promised, who shut the mouths of lions, quenched the fury of the flames and escaped the edge of the sword, whose weakness was turned to strength and who became powerful in battle and rooted foreign armies. Women received back their dead, raised to life again. Others were tortured and refused to be released so that they might gain a better resurrection. Some faced jeers and flogging, while still others were chained and put in prison. They were stoned, they were sawed in two, they were put to death by the sword. They went about in sheepskins and goatskins, destitute, persecuted and mistreated. The world was not worthy of them. They wandered in deserts and mountains and in caves and holes in the ground. These were all commended for their faith. Yet none of them received what had been promised. God had planned something better for us, so that only together with us would they be made perfect. Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles, and let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us. Let us fix our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith who for the joy set before him endured the cross, scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Good morning. Uh, those of you who are expecting to see Paul today, I'm sorry to disappoint you. It's me, Roger Broyd. Um, at least you won't have to look over the left-hand shoulder of Paul to that wall, that uh, plaster with those intriguing concentric squares that make you feel you're about to have a migraine. Those of us who've uh, led and spoken, sung, given children's talk uh, at the online service um, have at a later stage got used to the idea of seeing themselves on the big screen if they've been brave enough to. Um, furthermore, we also um, have no control who might be looking in today. For example, it's uh, an open forum, could be anybody, you know. Hi, Boris. Um, Thoughts like, uh, as I look in the screen, um, where have all the years gone by? Am I really that white haired? But I thank God that it is still true that uh, although the outward man might be perishing, the inward man is being renewed day by day. Nobody can be quite certain as to how, who wrote the letter to the Hebrews, which is found in the New Testament part of the Bible. Some say Paul, some Apollos, some Barnabas, but nobody's really quite certain. It seems clear that it was written to mainly Jewish believers, possibly living in Jerusalem, reassuring them that the faith that they've come to believe in is genuine and superior to the old faith they have come from. Uh, that uh, is that the process of removal of their sins uh, was superior now um, rather than the Old Testament, which was the process of sin removal by animals, by the constant sacrifice of animals. Um, and uh, that the new way with Jesus Christ as the high priest um, is far superior. It may have been that those Jewish believers had become wavering and wondering whether to return to Judaism. And as the uh, writer to the Hebrews um, continues his theme, uh, he reaches a particular climax in chapter 9, 
verses 19 and 25, uh, where he speaks about um, uh, as follows. Therefore, brethren, having boldness to enter the holiest by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way, which he consecrated for us through the veil, that is his flesh. He encourages his readers not to waver. So by the time we reach chapter 11, we find the writer has made a good case for, one, the superiority of Jesus over angels, two, that Jesus has become the great high priest once and for all. Um, the high priest was somebody who used to go and sacrifice um, and take the blood rather gruesomely into what was called the Holy of Holies in the tabernacle that God instructed Moses to build. Thirdly, that the old law was weak and that animal sacrifices were only temporary anyway. And fourthly, that all believers can now enter heaven because of this new and living way in which Jesus is both the high priest, able, so to speak, uh, to speak to God the Father on our behalf, and in fact was also the sacrifice on the cross for our sins once and forever. Thus, in chapter 11, uh, the writer exhorts his reader by the inspiring examples of the Old Testament saints, which foresaw what was coming by faith. They foresaw that there would be a new covenant, a new way, rather than the old way with its uh, defects. So we begin uh, in chapter 11, as was kindly read for us, uh, with verses 1 and 2. Now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. For by it, the elders obtained a good testimony. So it's clear that the chapter which followed the Old Testament saints had faith in God. Chapter 11 is sometimes referred to the chapter of the heroes of the faith, um, or the hall of faith, which is a, a phrase which I prefer. Now, the first thing we are told in verse 3 is that the worlds were made by the things that can be seen. I beg your pardon, the worlds were not made by the things that can be seen. So we have to exercise in faith in believing it was God who made it. One thing we can be clear on is this, that we didn't make the world and it didn't make itself. When I was a small boy, um, I used to ask myself repeatedly, where did this all come from, this solid, liquid and gas that we live in? And I concluded it must have been made by a creator. And now that I'm an old man, I see no reason to change my mind. It's still a valid question to ask unbelievers. Even materialistic scientists would not deny that the universe did not arise from the absence of anything. As the song says, by faith we see the hand of God in the light of creation, that grand design. I've been looking uh, during this period of lockdown on uh, other websites that also produce services and uh, I've noticed that one particularly gets about halfway through the sermon and then they break off to have a sing, um, to listen or listen to a song. Well, I'm afraid I can't promise you that. But what I am going to do is I'm going to tell you a story which has perhaps a bearing upon what follows. When I was a teenager, I became very interested in running, middle distance running. And I trained very hard and I joined a club, a running club. And uh, obviously during those times you would hear of people who were at the top of their game. And around about this time, there was a very famous uh, runner, not an Englishman, not a, from, from the UK, but an Australian, a man called Ron Clark. And Ron Clark became a sort of hero of mine. Um, he not only uh, broke re world records, he absolutely annihilated them, often taking 20 seconds off, let's say the 5,000 or the three miles or the six miles or the 10,000 meters. He was a head and shoulders above anybody else. I once remember going to see him at the White City, which was at that stage the national stadium for um, athletics. And um, when he ran, he just simply left everybody else behind. And it wasn't uncommon, as was the case right as I observed, um, to beat the next person by half a lap, by at least 220 yards, as we measured out the tracks in those days. 
But there was one thing that Ron Clark never did. He never won a gold medal at the Olympics. I well remember in the Mexico Games um, coming in third place and lying flat on his back and having to be given oxygen because, of course, it was a high altitude Olympic Games at 10,000 feet. Um, when his career was over, he was invited by the famous Czechoslovakian runner Emil Zatopek to come for a visit in Prague. Zatopek ran for Czechoslovakia and he himself was a terrific runner. His, rain, his training schedule uh, consisted of running a 440 lap or maybe 400 meters where he was resting and running another one and he would do this 100 times. He was the only athlete and still is who has won the 5,000, the 10,000 and the marathon Olympic game gold medal. The only person ever to do that. So Ron Clark was pleased to accept this uh, invitation, went to Czechoslovakia, went to Prague, had a very nice time with Zatbeck, who was a very intelligent man, could speak six languages, um, was shown around the, uh, the sites. I remember this was the height of the Cold War. And when it came to leave, when he came to leave, Ron Clark uh, went to go on the uh, aeroplane and, and Zatopek said, I'll come with you. Only Emil Zatopek could get away with that, passing through customs, going onto the plane with Ron Clark. He was a national hero, of course. And just as we're about to leave, Zatopek hands Clark uh, a, a, a pile, uh, a, a parcel. And uh, he says to him in hushed tone, please don't open this until you're well clear of Czechoslovakian airspace. Oh, this worried uh, Ron Clark. He thought, well, was this a message uh, to get out to the West about the horrible regime uh, that was uh, uh, holding the Czechoslovakian prisoners or whatever. But uh, when the plane took off, um, Ron Clark couldn't wait any longer. He tore the parcel open and there he discovered one of Zatopek's gold medals. Um, at that point, Zatopek became my second hero. Uh, and one could spiritualise this story, of course. One could say that um, Ron Clark was given something that he'd not deserved, he'd not earned, just as we have been given salvation by our Lord Jesus Christ. But I just make this story as by way of an interlude. And also um, to say that he was part of my Hall of Fame. And as I say, the Bible also has a Hall of Fame. And um, that starts in chapter 11. Now in this Hall of Fame, in which all manner of Old Testament characters are lionised because of their faith, often against fierce opposition, but equally because uh, they exercise great faith in difficult circumstances. So perhaps we should, as I've suggested earlier, call it the Hall of Faith rather than of Fame. They are there to inspire us. Um, they obtained a good reputation by their style of life, their dedication and their persistent sacrifice. Now, if I may borrow a phrase from the writer of that time, time does not permit me to go through all the examples set before us. So I've chosen just three. In verse four, of chapter 11 we see that Abel is listed as one of those um, one of those who've earned a good reputation through faith this was an example of faith at the dawn of history let's look at Abel by faith Abel gave a more perfect sacrifice to God than to his brother than his brother Cain which was ultimately going to cost him his life Yet he was determined to give God the best he could. He wanted to please God. Perhaps his parents, Adam and Eve, had told him of their disastrous decision that they'd made by eating of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil when forbidden to do so. But perhaps they also made known um, a time when the heel of one of their descendants would bruise the serpent, who is, uh, of course, Satan, bruise his head. But in the meantime, there needed to be a sacrifice for sins, for the newly fallen nature, if indeed that was the kind of sacrifice at this time. Certainly, he brought the firstborn of his flock, and certainly uh, he was there to please God. Uh, my second um, 
uh, person is Abraham and his wife Sarah. Abraham had been childless. They had reached old age, um, but God had promised a son and heir. So in old age, they'd had Isaac. The boy grew and flourished. No doubt he was a delight to his parents, as all small children should be, totally dependent, then crawling, walking his first steps, his first words, his desire to help, to explore, to imitate, to grow his limitless curiosity, his innocent selfishness, he'd not been taught to share yet. Then as a young boy following in his dad's footsteps, the son of the promise, Maybe by this time he was a young teenager. And then, suddenly, that promise snatched away, or so it seemed. The devastating words found in Genesis chapter 22 and verse 2, um, where Abraham is asked to take his son, his only son, um, up a mountain and to sacrifice him as a test to show Abraham's faith. Christians don't worship a God who can be domesticated, who is a tame God, who fits into our image, who obliges us. Nevertheless, he is, in the words of Mr. Beaver uh, from The Lion, the Witch and the Wardrobe, who's really speaking about God. He is asked if he was a tame God. Mr. Beaver said, no, no, of course he's not. But he is good and always seeks for our good, whose design on our lives is for perfection for righteousness. Peter Maiden was a regular speaker at the Keswick Convention, who sadly died earlier this year. Um, I had the privilege last year of going to um, hear him at what I think was the last message he ever gave at the Keswick Convention. And during his talk, he spoke at a time when his son had become dangerously ill. He went to see him on his own and on his own, he remonstrated with God. Oh God, you cannot take my son from me, he cried out. He never finished that story. I never did hear what happened to his son. But the theme of his talk was cultivating the art of thankfulness. I remember the, the key phrase he used. In life, all we're really entitled to is judgment. So how would you as a parent, if these words from God come to you, what would you feel? Anguish, complaint, refusal, denial? Read the pages for ourselves back in Genesis. Read and try and discover how Abraham felt and you will find absolutely nothing. Silent obedience, followed by a long journey up a mountain until that awful moment arrived and the knife is raised and the heart, no doubt, is breaking. Even though Abraham believed in a resurrection, no father wants to bring this hurt upon his son. And the faithfulness is proved and the hand is stayed from the act of slaughter and a ram is provided instead. Abraham has passed the test. Abraham is made of faith. Can you imagine the relief on the journey back, the laughter, the light heartedness, the light feet. Um, if we look in Hebrews 11 and read verse 19, something stunning occurs there. And this is what the writer says, I'm cutting in from a piece of conversation is involved in concluding that God was able to raise him up even from the dead, from which he also received in a figurative sense. So Abraham believed that Isaac would be raised even if he'd suffered, um, suffered death at the hands of his father. And I was reminded in a talk that the late Rabbi Zacharias gave, he was using this story and then suddenly he said 2,000 years later, another father caused his son to go up a journey to a hill. No doubt, doubt it was not very far from the one that Abraham had gone up. To the Son Jesus and God the Father, it was God the Father who this time did not spare his Son. As the Father's heart was breaking and broke, remember the phrase, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? 
so that he would become our great high priest, that is Jesus, and offering. The high priest would enter the tabernacle from uh, in the Old Testament days uh, into the holiest place of all once a year with the blood of another, as the writer to the Hebrews puts it in verse 25 of chapter 9. But now Jesus enters into the holiest of holiest as high priest, bringing his own blood, the blood of the God-man. Ah, well, as I've said, borrowing the phrase from the writer of the Hebrews, time would fail for me to tell you about Gideon and Barak and Samson. So we pass in our Bibles to verse 35, to my third person. It's about 1300 years later from Abraham. Um, the phrase is used, women receive their dead, raised to life again, to a story with some parallels to that of Abraham and Isaac, to Shunem, a place in the northern kingdom of Israel. You'll remember by this time Israel had divided and there were two kingdoms, Judah in the south and Israel in the north. Israel was a thoroughly apostate nation ruled by kings and every one was a bad one. But there were those who had not forsaken the God of Israel. In Elijah the prophet's time we hear that there were 7,000 who had not bowed the knee in other directions. But this is now the time of Elijah, Elijah's successor. And we go to Shunem, which is a place west of the River Jordan. There was what the Bible calls a notable woman, or alternatively a great woman. Her name is not revealed. She's the only woman in the Old Testament who was described as the wife of her husband, and yet her name was not told. She was a generous woman. Um, Paul, writing to the Corinthians many, many years later, said, there are not many noble who are called, but not does not mean none. A woman given to hospitality, as we should be. She regularly offers Elisha food as he passes by the holy man of God, as she calls him. This good deed becomes a habit, which of course is a good thing in itself. Soon at her suggestion, um, they have built a room built for him, a bed for the night. And Elijah is so impressed, he wonders what he can do for her. The Shunammite woman is summoned and promised a son in a year's time. Her reaction? No, my Lord, man of God, do not lie to your maidservant. Shades of Sarah here. You see, her husband was very old and she didn't expect uh, ever to give birth. Yes, there was a bit of unbelief there, but there was also humility. Uh, but when you get a prophecy from God, you do not get half measures. Notice how um, God through Elisha had pro prophesied not just a child, but a son. This was vintage Yahweh. So a son is born, a sheer delight, a light in her life, a son and heir. And then, like Abraham, disaster. He was out in the fields with his father and the reapers of the harvest and collapses with a terrible headache, possibly an inflammation of the brain, possibly sunstroke, we're not told. So they bring him inside and sit him on his mother's knee while his life seeps away and his mother looks helplessly on. I would not have liked to have been there. One of the most loving relationships in nature exists between a mother and her child. Yet even that, the Bible tells us, is surpassed by the love that exists between God and his people. In Isaiah 49 verse 16 it writes, See, I have inscribed you on the palms of my hand. Um, I beg your pardon, I'm reading the wrong verse. Verse before, Can a woman forget her nursing child and not have compassion on the son of her womb? Surely they may forget, yet I will not forget you. And God does not forget the Shunammite woman either. And it's this point that's revealed why she is, the, why she is in the hall of faith. She says to her husband, it is well. But I think the interpretation really possibly means it will be well. She believes in a miracle working God. She believes in a resurrection. They saddle up the donkey, the servant and the woman, to see Elisha. Poor donkey, did he expect an easy ride? Saddled up with the frantic woman riding you, a flurry of activity, the Shunammite to Elisha, Elisha to the house, the boys raised to life again. And it was well as she predicted. 
Perhaps her faith had been stirred when she heard of Elijah raising another boy from the dead. Perhaps she'd been in the company of this holy man and his company would have been uplifting to her, as the company of Christians often is to me, for example. Her faith was rewarded by her hospitality. She knew all things were possible with God. She exercised faith. She exercised persistence. So the Shunammite woman was one of those great cloud of witnesses to our inspiration. Consider what they triumphed or endured, stoned, tortured, flogged, ridiculed, executed, slain with a sword, lived in poverty, destitute, tormented, homeless, were given supernatural strength, caused buildings and walls to collapse, survived searing heat, survived the night with wild animals, and all because they gained a good testimony of their faith. But why did they do it? Why suffer in, uh, in many cases such hardship? So much easier for them just to go with the flow, to opt for the easier life, join the false prophets, even those written to had suffered hardship. Even the writer to the Hebrews, he, he says in verse 32 of chapter nine, you endured a great struggle with suffering. Even the writer himself describes his position at one time in chains. The writer is encouraging the readers to persist and endure in the Christian faith and not to return to the accepted religion of Judaism. Judaism gained for itself an exception in the Roman culture of paganism. So in Judaism, you were safe to persevere in the race. All of those in the Hall of Fame had persevered, having through faith perceived to varying degrees a place, a better promise of a rest, of a heavenly city, a place where of incorruptible, everlasting permanence with their everlasting God. They weren't perfect people. Think of Rahab, the prostitute, or Jephthah, whose rash vow over his daughter would cause very, would um, be very costly. And to Samson and his Delilah, to David, who at one time was a murdering adulterer, to Barak, who was to play second fiddle to Deborah, to, even to Abraham, who lied about his wife. Yet all these were included perhaps to show that they were fallible and that Jesus, now our high priest, forgives in a manner superior than the old covenant of animal sacrifices. And since that day, there have been millions of others who could inspire us on. So what are you trusting God for today? Let's be inspired by those who've gone before, um, in spite of their weaknesses. They are those who have gone before. Uh, they are those of whom the writer works with those wonderful words, of whom the world was not worthy who are set down for our inspiration, but not as much as the person listed in verse 2 of chapter 12, the author and finisher of our faith, who endured suffering like no one else in history, looking to him, lest, as the writer put it, we become discouraged. And what of those who have not even begun this race? What is there for you? About 120 years ago in China, there took place a revolution called the Boxer Revolution. And during this time, many of Westerners, missionaries particularly, were targeted and were executed, murdered, martyred, raped, killed. On one occasion, uh, the Boxers arrived in a particular compound where there were over 100 Christians. And the leader of the Boxers um, decided to allow them to go free provided that they would tread on the cross that he'd put in the mud just before them. I've forgotten how many it was, but something like nine of them immediately went through, went past, uh, went over the cross and off to freedom. But one young girl who'd recently been converted, to her, Jesus was so precious that she could not do such a thing. So she, one of the youngest, if not the youngest there, bypassed the cross and went to her death, followed by 90 odd others who saw her example. They were looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of their faith. So to give you another simple example of what Jesus does for people, I heard only recently of a man who was an alcoholic um, and his son put it this way after he was wonderfully converted 
who was looking unto Jesus. He said, I have never seen water turned into wine, but I've seen beer turned into furniture. The change of life that came over that man was so intense that they then lived a normal life uh, and had money whereby before it was all spent on drink. God is for you, urging you to join the race, to finish what uh, Jesus will start in your heart. C.S. Lewis put it this way. There's a place at home where we were always meant to occupy. If you feel a stranger in this world, the likely explanation is that you were meant for a different world, a heavenly Jerusalem, a city of the living God, as the writer of the Hebrews puts it. See you there. Amen.
Thank you. Trust the Lord has helped and spoken to you. Let's pray together. Again, our God, we commend ourselves to you. Thank you for any truth, help, enlightenment, challenge, comfort that's come from you to us as we have listened. We pray that we may find that you create faith in yourself, in us. Given all the evidence and all that we need through the ministry of the Spirit and your word, help us to confide entirely in you. We commend ourselves to you and seek your blessing, the blessing of the Almighty God. Father, Son and Spirit, abide with all who trust you. Amen.